Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Franz Fanon was, among other things, a practicing psychoanalyst, and so it's no surprise that within his work, Black Skin, White Mask, psychoanalysis would assume a real centrality of, of place in, in approach. And in complex ways that we're going to explore here, he tells us that the focus of the work in general, and I think this is pretty much dead on, is a psychoanalytical interpretation of what he calls the black problem, which itself is quite complex. It's not something you can frame in just a sentence or two, although he does give you a number of nice, pithy uh, exemplifications of this in, in the process of the work. But those are launching points rather than full formulations of the, the problem or the issue that he's, he's working at. And early on in the work, he says that, um, here we go, I have to say certain things. The analysis I am undertaking is psychological. In spite of this, it is apparent to me that the effect of disalienation, so that's, that's one of the goals right there, the disalienation of the black person entails an immediate recognition of social and economic realities. And so this is going to be something really central to his approach. You cannot have a psychoanalysis that ignores history, that ignores the way society is set up, that ignores economic realities and how economics is not a you know pure domain but intrudes into all these other domains as well. So he goes on and he says, if there is an inferiority complex, it is the outcome of a double process, primarily economic, subsequently the internalization or better the epidermalization, meaning going under the skin of this inferiority. So, you know, that, that is uh, quite good. He, he also calls this a sociodiagnostic as well. And if you look at the work as a whole, there's actually two chapters that are devoted specifically to examining psychoanalytic um, interpretations, diagnoses, things like that. The chapter four, so-called dependency complex of colonized people. And then there's actually a chapter, uh, chapter six, the Negro and psychopathology. But also in chapter seven, about half of the chapter is devoted to considering Adler's um, ego psychology. So it's, it's really quite important here. He is engaging in critiques of other psychoanalytic theorists. And there are a, a few passages I thought would be good to bring uh, out into the fore. And when we say critique, a lot of people interpret this word critique as like you're going to smash something and knock it down. No, critiques are careful. If, if it's not careful, it's not a critique. It's just complaining, right? And what a critique is doing is saying, okay, this part over here, this actually seems pretty dead on. This part over here, it's, it's not really working. And you could also go into like, you know, well, what are the conditions of the possibility of doing this sort of transcendental critique? There's a lot of different ways to critique. Critique is not primarily aimed at being negative and just disrupting matters. So, um, he says, here we go, psychoanalytic schools have studied the neurotic reactions that arise among certain groups in certain areas of civilization in response to the requirements of dialectic. What does that mean? We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. One should investigate the extent to which the conclusions of Freud or of Adler can be applied to the effort to understand the man of color's 
view of the world. Can somebody like Freud, can somebody like Adler, who are conscious of colonialism taking place, who know about, uh, you know, effectively becoming multicultural societies, you know, at, at the time that, say, Adler is working, uh, you know, it, you could say that there's much more hierarchy than there is is today uh, in terms of, of you know how people are treated and categorized and segregated, but um, you know they don't really have as much to say about the issue now. Fanon doesn't think that just not being uh, black or not having come from a particular place makes it impossible for you to enter into the world of other people's lived experiences. As a matter of fact, he clarifies in the work that it is actually possible to, to go into other people's lived experiences, but it takes work. And he thinks that, that Freud and Adler haven't actually managed to do that. A little bit later on in the work, he brings Jung in there as well. He says, the reason I'm calling this chapter The Negro and Psychopathology, well aware that Freud and Adler and even the cosmic Jung did not think of the Negro in all their investigations. And then he also says um, they were quite right not to have um, because maybe their theories didn't apply as well. You know, the, he gives us an example, the Oedipus complex. Not everybody has an Oedipus complex. You know, Freud thought everybody did and, and others following after him try to generalize it. Lacan, by the way, who he's going to bring up a little bit later in some of his seminars will suggest that the Oedipus complex is really a master of Western, a matter rather of Western thought and, and organization. And the West might even be able to get rid of it as well in, in some way down the line that it doesn't apply universally. So let's talk about the, the particular theorists that he brings up and what he gets out of them and what he says they, they're missing out on. So Freud, of course, you know, father of psychoanalysis, he credits Freud for having focused on what he calls the individual factor. And this is, this is quite important because it's not as if psychology or even uh, psychotherapy wasn't being carried out before Freud, right? <laughs> was going on for quite a long time. There was even a profession of people called alienists to, to deal with those who were deemed insane. And so Freud is actually reacting against an entire uh, tendency, as Fanon says. He says, this is a constitutionalist tendency. What is a constitutionalist tendency? It says, well, you know, people are reacting in sort of normal or abnormal ways because of the constitutions that they have. That is the way that in which their body is put together. It could be temperaments, right? It could be tied in with all sorts of different things. And maybe you can modify it. Maybe you can't modify it. And um, Freud paid attention to the individual patient. Now, if you read Freud's case histories, sometimes you're like, well, he paid attention to what he wanted to pay attention to. Um, there, there's a lot of problems with that. But this focus on the individual factor, very important. He says, Freud insisted the individual factor be taken into account through psychoanalysis. He substituted for a phylogenetic theory, the ontogenetic perspective. And then he says, uh, this is Fanon. It will be seen that the black man's alienation is not, however, an individual question beside phylogeny and ontogeny stands sociogeny. And this is why he talks about a sociodiagnostic. So Freud is good for focusing on the individ individual factor, which is being left out. And he also focuses on the experience and repression of trauma. But the, the framework that he sets up is too restrictive for examining the kinds of subjects that, that Fanon thinks is vital, not just important, but vital for dealing with this alienation. So he goes on and he says, uh, this is deep in the work. Um, he's talking about, about Freud and the, the experience of, of trauma, right? He says that this is something we can, we can learn from him and that, you know, these things are supposed to occur within the family. But the problem is, and he's saying this in the Negro and patho psychopathology, the characteristics of the family are projected onto the social environment, and that's not being adequately taken into account by Freud. So there's this focus on family dynamics. That's good. You know, uh, the family is a place in which things are being played out, right? Uh, 
Um, on the unconscious, that's an, that's an important realization. Now, what exactly the unconscious is going to be? Okay, different theorists have different ways of dealing with it. Is something purely individual? Is it something that is you know across cultures? The collective unconscious? Is it somewhere in between? Is it the unconscious structured as a language? Okay, we can put that aside. Then we move on to Manoni, and Fanon get, devotes an entire chapter to Manoni's book. Uh, Prospero, Prospero and Caliban, right, which is about the you know, colonial mindset and, and all the issues that are going on. And uh, Manoni spent a lot of time in Madagascar. And um, Fanon actually says this is a dangerous book. It's dangerous because it, it is partly right, but also in many respects deeply wrong. And Manoni postulated a dependency complex among colonized people, using Madagascar as a prime example. So the idea behind the de dependency complex is that <clears throat> the reason why some people have been colonized, why some people have been subordinated, is that within them as a people and as individuals, there is this, you could call it weakness, this, this willingness to be dominated by another and obviously, this is something that is, is like I say, postulated rather than something that is revealed. And um, Fanon thinks that this is, this is quite wrong. This is the uh, sort of putting the cart before the horse in explanation. It's not really explaining anything. And he says that, you know, if you look at all of these, these relations between people, how did this actually play itself out. He says, not all people, Manoni says, not all peoples can be colonized, only those who experience this need for dependency. Wherever Europeans have founded colonies of the type we're considering, it can safely be said that their coming was unconsciously expected, even desired by the future subject people. And, you know, Fanon goes and says, well, there's plenty of other explanations for this. You know, it could be that the Europeans just came in and dominated the place. It could be that they took advantage of the hospitality that was being offered them. It could be that they, uh, you know, misrepresented what was going on. So he, he's, you know, saying that Manoni is really failing to take stock of, of the racism that is developing and driving this. And he's got two good passages here discussing this. He says, uh, Manoni says that colonial exploitation is not the same as other forms of exploitation and colonial racialism is different from other kinds of racialism. He speaks of phenomenology, of psychoanalysis. We would be happier if these terms had been, t if they'd taken on a more concrete quality for him. And here's where Fanon lays his hand on the table. All forms of exploitation resemble one another. Colonial racism is no different than any other kind of racism. It's not caused by a dependency complex that then justifies it. It's caused by the fact that people are imposing things. And he goes on and he says a little bit later on, I begin to suffer from not being a white man to the degree that the white man imposes discrimination on me, makes me a colonized native, robs me of all worth, all individuality, tells me I'm a parasite on the world, that I must bring myself as quickly as possible into step with the white world, that I'm a brute beast, my people and I are like a walking dung heap that disgustingly fertilizes sweet sugar cane and silky cotton, that I have no use in the world. He says, then I will quite simply try to make myself white. That is, I will compel the white man to acknowledge that I'm human. M Manoni will counter, you cannot do it because in your depths there's a dependency complex. And so, you know, Fanon is saying, okay, there might be a dependency complex, but that's not the cause, that's the effect of all of this other stuff that's going on. So Minoni, you've, you've like totally got things backwards. And, you know, this is often the case with psychoanalysis, isn't it? Um, he's also got a great example there of the interpretation of dreams. You know, Freudian psychoanalysis, big stress on dream interpretation. Fanon himself thinks that this is quite useful uh, and does it with his own patients. But um, you've got to be careful in how you're interpreting the dream, right? So he, he's got some examples here of... of uh, people from Madagascar who are talking about these scary dreams and experiences that they're having, uh, many of whom are, are, are children. 
And he says, um, you know, who, who is the black bull? Do we have to go to some sort of archetype to do it? No, these are Senegalese soldiers who are actually imposing the French, you know, uh, colonial government's desires upon these people and engaging in horrible atrocities. You know, it, it's, it's quite natural that the things from our lived experience take place in our dreams. We don't have to go to some crazy psychoanalytic, you know, uh, explanation of it that ignores the fact of living in a racist society, right? So Manoni is, is going to be, you know, viewed as, as uh, quite off base, but revealing some things to us. He also talks about Jacques Lacan. Manoni and Lacan, by the way, have a connection to each other uh, in France down the line. So Lacan, he credits with attacking the idea of the constitutional, uh, as, as Freud did uh, himself. And that's, that's a good thing on, on his view, this notion that, uh, you know, human beings, here we go, in the domain of psychoanalysis, as in that of uh, psych philosophy, the organic or constitutional, is a myth only for him who can go beyond it. Um, you know, we, we are kind of stuck with it. He says, earlier I referred to Jacques Lacan. It was not by accident. In his thesis, he violently attacked the idea of the constitutional. And then he says, apparently I'm departing from his conclusions, but my dissent will be understood that when, that when one recalls that for the idea of the constitutional, as it is understood by the French school, I am substituting the idea of structure, embracing unconscious psychic life as we're able to know it in part, especially in the form of repression and inhibition, insofar as these elements take an active part in the organization peculiar to each psychic individuality. And here he quotes uh, Gu, who, who we're going to look at a little bit later. So, you know, he's saying Lacan is, is useful in some respects. He also thinks that Lacan goes too far into buying into and defending the Oedipus complex, he's got a footnote here, and he says, um, Dr. Lacan talks about the abundance of the Oedipus complex, but even if the young boy has to kill his father, it's still necessary, the father, uh, to accept being killed. And, you know, he, he says, listen, the, the Oedipus complex, I'm not sure that this really works. And then he says the collapse of moral values in France after the war was perhaps the result of the defeat of that moral being which the nation represented. We know what such traumatizations, traumatisms on the family level may produce. So, you know, the Oedipus complex, part of, you could say, Freudian orthodoxy, um, not particularly helpful to try to put out onto all the rest of the world. Um, Lacan is kind of an equivocal character when it comes to this. There's also a really long, interesting discussion in a footnote that spans several pages of Lacan's um, mirror stage ideas, which I'm just going to mention here and not try to go into depth about because that's, that's kind of a tricky concept. And Fanon doesn't, doesn't do all that much with it except to note that when certain experiments are carried out on certain people like Antillians, they, the other who's projected doesn't have color, is neither black nor, nor white. So that's interesting. Jung he brings up as well. And he says that Jung um, is actually quite helpful with, with one idea, at least that of the collective unconsciousness, but then he gets it uh, quite wrong and understandably so. <clears throat> so he, he says here, uh, this is talking about the you know, Freudian neuroses coming from particular traumas and experiences. He says, what do we see in the case of the black man? Unless we make use of that frightening postulate, which so destroys our balance offered by Jung, the collective unconscious, we can understand absolutely nothing. We can't just focus on the individual. We do have to think about <clears throat> people as belonging to collectivities, which would have their own unconsciouses. And, you know, by the way, this is not so radically different than Lacan. The unconscious is structured like a language. You don't have your own private language. You belong to an open-ended language. Very different than Jung's collective unconscious, though. So he says, how is one to... A, a drama is enacted every day in colonized countries. Um, and and he, he talks about how, how this drama plays out. How do you explain this. But then he says that um, Jung has effectively <clears throat> misappropriated this idea and misapplied it to um, colonized peoples. So here we go. 
It says, um, I naturally found myself on the threshold of Jungian psychology. European civilization is characterized by the presence at the heart of which Jung calls the collective unconscious of an archetype, an expression of the bad instincts, of the darkness inherent in every ego, of the uncivilized savage, the Negro who slumbers in every white man. And Jung claims to have found in uncivilized peoples the same psychic structure his diagram portrays. So there's two claims being made there. In European civilization, according to Jung, there's this dark figure, an archetype that is, is within all of us and we all have to repress it. And it's exemplified in the African Negro, right? And then it's also found in every other culture as well, presumably including those of Africa, this, this dark figure. And then he, and then he says, um, personally, I think Jung has deceived himself in all the people that he has known, whether the Pueblo Indians of Arizona or the Negroes of Kenya and British East Africa, all of these have had more or less traumatic contacts with the white man. And so that is something that Jung doesn't take account of. He says, the collective unconscious without our having to fall back on the genes is purely and simply the sum of prejudices, myths, collective attitudes of a given group. The collective unconsciousness is not something that is just built in and plays itself out. It is something extremely cultural, which means it's also historical, right? It has a, an existence to it that develops within time. A little bit further, he says, uh, on the level of philosophical discussion, we would be bringing up the old problem of instinct and habit. Instinct, which is inborn, invariable, specific habit, which is acquired. On this level, one would have to only demonstrate Jung is confused, instinct and habit. So, you know, that's, that's an important charge right there. He goes on a little bit further and he's talking about um, Jung identifying the foreign with the obscure, with the tendency to evil, uh, this being part, particularly problematic. And then he goes a little bit further on and he says, the collective unconscious is not dependent on cerebral heredity. It is the result of what I call the unreflected imposition of a culture. And he gives an example here. There's no reason to be surprised when an Antillian exposed to waking dream therapy relives the same fantasies as a European. It is because the Antillian partakes of the same collective unconsciousness as the European and not, you know, uh, of, of Africans. But that could all change, you know, if it is not simply biological or race-based or genetic or anything like this and it is cultural, well, then, then Jung would be a bit off base. We can shift gears and talk about Adler. Adler focused very much on individual psychology. Um, and early on in the work, uh, Fanon says that this is a, quite useful and helpful. Um, he, he thinks that uh, Adler uh, is, is getting us towards something that can be uh, of use. But then uh, he, he talks about in this entire section on Adler towards the end in the second to last chapter, um, Adler was postulating this desire for recognition, for um, being essentially seen as oneself, as one wants to be by the other. And so here's this long passage that, that um, Fanon quotes. From whatever direction one approaches the analysis of abnormal psychogenic conditions, one soon finds oneself in the presence of the following phenomenon. The whole picture of the neurosis, as well as its, all of its symptoms, emerges as under the influence of some final goal, indeed as projections of this goal. One can ascribe the character of a formative cause to this final goal, the quality of a principle of orientation. And he goes on, he says, try to find the meaning and direction of unhealthy manifestations. You come to face to face with a chaotic throng of tendencies, impulses, weaknesses, anomalies. But if we accept the hypothesis of a final goal or causal finality, we see the shadows dissolve at once and we can read the soul of the patient like the pages of a book. So we can totally understand what's going on with the patient. And um, Fanon goes on to say, it's on the basis of similar theoretical positions that in general, the most stupendous frauds of our period are constructed. 
So, you know, that's not really an endorsement of Adler there, now is it? And he says, so, you know, we have to be pretty careful in, in uh, doing these things. Not because Adler's actually wrong about us desiring what we desire, but he's not understanding the context, the social context, the racial context in which it has been placed. He's missing the fundamental structure of, of things. And so he goes on and he, he talks about, you know, the other and uh, how, we, how we engage with the other and about narcissism. Let's, let's move ahead, though, he says. Here the difficulties begin. In effect, Adler has created a psychology of the individual. We have seen that the feeling of inferiority is a characteristic of the Antillians. It is not ju just this or that Antillian who embodies the neurotic formation, but all Antillians. Antillian society is a neurotic society, a society of comparison. And so he says that the Martinique, and one of the particular islands in the Antilles, is and is not a neurotic if we were strict in applying the conclusions of the Adlerian school, we should say the Negro is seeking to protest against the inferiority he feels. But now Fanon adds an important word here, historically. Since in all periods the Negro has been an inferior, he attempts to react with a superiority complex, and this doesn't, doesn't really work out. And he's got this interesting um, reworking uh, of Adler, he says that the Martinican does not compare himself with the white man as father, leader, God. He compares himself with his fellow against the pattern of the white man. So instead of the Adlerian schema of the ego greater than the other, superiority is a response to inferiority complex, he says we have to have a triadic relation, which has the white above and then ego different from the other. And he says the Adlerian comparison embraces two terms. It's polarized by the ego. The Antillian comparison is surmounted by a third term. Its governing fiction is not personal, but social. So this is really you know, quite an excellent way of reformulating things. We're not going to get rid of Adler altogether. We're not going to throw his insights completely away. We're going to rework them. And this is also what's happening in terms of uh, Germain Gu, uh, who talks about a pre-Oedipal abandonment neurosis. Um, and this is, this is uh, sketched out, as, as I mentioned, she's, she's cited earlier in the work. Um, here we go. Gu ana analyzes two types, the first of which seems to illustrate the plight of this author, Jean Venus. It is this tripod, the anguish created by every abandonment, the aggression to which it gives rise, and the devaluation of self that flows out of it that supports the whole symptomology of this neurosis. Now, the, the issue, however, is, is Venus really representative um, of what's going on, or is he kind of you know, an outlier. And, and Fanon says that Venus is a neurotic. His color is only a, an attempt to explain his psychic structure. If this objective difference had not existed, he would have manufactured it out of nothing. He is one of those intellectuals who try to take a position solely on the level of ideas. Skipping down a little bit, he says, I contend Jean Venus represents not an example of black-white relations, but a certain mode of behavior in a neurotic who by coincidence is black. And so that, that line is not going to be all that useful, although that doesn't mean we have to throw out Q. So what does Fanon then bring to the picture? And I, I'm, I'm not going to give you everything. You should read the book itself. Um, but there are a few particularly important sections and passages where he, he sets things out. He talks about making things conscious, right? He says, uh, as, as a psychoanalytic uh, practitioner, my goal is to make things conscious. Um, my patient is suffering from an inferiority complex. If he's overwhelmed to such a degree by the wish to be white, it's because he lives in a society that makes this possible. So what we have to do then is help my patient become conscious of his unconscious and abandon his attempts at a hallucinatory whitening. But that's the individual part also to act in the direction of a change in the social structure. In other words, the black man should no longer be confronted by the dilemma, turn white or disappear, but he should be able to take cognizance of a possibility of existence. So there's an existential aspect to it. That's also quite similar to what's going on in Lacanian psychoanalysis, by the way. 
Um, we can go on a little bit further and talk about uh, this, this two-part study that he, he tells us that, that we need to engage in, a psychoanalytic interpretation of the life experience of the black man and a psychoanalytic interpretation of the Negro myth, which is being carried out in here by talking about uh, Negrophobia and, and other aspects of culture through representation, right? He also talks about uh, carrying out an analysis of the real. And, and he says it's always difficult as an investigator. Um, we can choose between two attitudes. We can be satisfied only to describe, or once we've described reality, we can make up our mind to change it. So he wants to produce interventions, ultimately, that would be changing things, both for individuals and for the larger dynamic. Finally, I think that one of the things that's really important in here is Fanon, at a number of different points, says that the responses that, that black subjects are having are in some respect rational and normal within an abnormal situation of colonialism, racism, economic exploitation, all of those sorts of things. We can uh, pick out a few examples of, of him bringing this up. He says, um, going up against something unreasoned, psychoanalysts say nothing is more traumatizing for the young kid than his encounters with what is rational. I would personally say that for a man whose only weapon is reason, there's nothing more neurotic than contact with unreason. You know, the, the dynamics that we experience of injustice, of unfairness, of, you know, intransigence on the part of this, this entire world, that will take a rational person and make them seem to be irrational. I think maybe one other prime example would be, be good here. He says that, um, here we go, uh, talking about, about children and, and families. Um, he says, a normal Negro child, having grown up within a normal family, will become abnormal on contact with the white world. Why? Because of its fundamental irrationality and it's forcing people into categories that really don't fit them well and require a deformation on their part if they're going to fit in or sometimes even survive. So uh, a lot of discussion here of, of how psychoanalysis plays out in this very uh, uh, you know, penetrating work. Um, I've actually only kind of scratched the surface and I, uh, you know, I always say this with these core concept videos, it's very important to read the text. And so, you know, if you do that, you're going to go beyond what we've got here and see yet more discussion of psychoanalysis. But in order to keep it uh, relatively short and self-contained, we're going to end here.